Paul Sweeney. Number one, Mr. Speaker. The Prime Minister. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, it has been announced this morning that Sir Jeremy Haywood is sadly standing down as Cabinet Secretary and Head of the Civil Service to concentrate on his recovery from ill health. Jeremy has been an exemplary public servant over more than three decades, serving with the highest distinction Prime Ministers and Ministers of all parties in the finest traditions of the Civil Service. As he steps down, he can look back on a contribution to public life few in our country can match. And I am personally very grateful to him for the support he has given me as Prime Minister since my first day in number 10. I am sure the whole House will join me in offering our very best wishes to Jeremy and his family. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mr Paul Sweeney. Two teenage brothers from my constituency, Somer and Arib, have lived in Glasgow since the youngest was five years old. They are now naturalised Glaswegians, but they live in constant fear of deportation to a country where they fled in fear of their lives. Their school friends at Springburn Academy rallied to their cause by launching a petition that has now been signed by over 90,000 people and was recently presented to the Home Office by the school and the moderator of the Church of Scotland. However, this action has been met with callous indifference. When the Leader of the Opposition met the children in August, he was appalled by the lack of compassion shown by the Home Office towards these boys who have been kept in limbo for years. Will the Prime Minister now review this case and meet with these boys to witness at first hand what life is like at the sharp end of this Government's hostile environment? Prime Minister. Every case in, uh, in relation to people's right to stay here in the United Kingdom is looked at extremely carefully, and I will certainly ensure that the Home Office looks again at this case. Sir David Amos. If, if music be the food of love, we could certainly do with a lot of music just now. So, in that regard, will my right honourable friend join me in welcoming Sir Michael Parkinson? who opened the United Kingdom's first jazz centre in Southend on Saturday, inspired by Digby Fairweather, displaying wonderful jazz memorabilia and music. And is that not yet another reason why Southend should be declared as this? The Prime Minister! Can I, can I say to my honourable friend, I have been known, of course, to move to a little bit of music myself on occasions. Um, can I, can I thank him? Can I thank him for highlighting this uh, this excellent new centre? I'm extremely pleased. I'm extremely pleased that the centre was opened by my constituent, Sir Michael Parkinson. Um, he may know that culture is one of the key strands of the government's Great Britain campaign. That's about promoting arts from across the whole of the UK to global audiences. And we like to see and support events around the country showcasing the excellent range of performing arts we, are, we have. And I'd like to join my honourable friend in welcoming this new jazz centre. And I note once again the bid he has put in in relation to South End. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I do join the Prime Minister in thanking the former Head of the Civil Service, Jeremy Hayward, for his public service. Wish him well on his recovery, and I have to say, in my conversations with him, what an impressive, well-informed and dedicated public servant he is. And I really do hope he gets through this very difficult condition he's in at the present time. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister says austerity is over. The Conservative leader of Walsall Council says austerity is alive and kicking. Who's right? Minister. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, indeed, after a decade of working, a decade of austerity, people need to know that their hard work has paid off, and because of their sacrifices, there are better days ahead. So, we will be setting out our approach. We will be setting out our approach in the spending review next year. What does it mean? I'll tell him what it means. It means debt uh, going down as a share of the economy and support for public services going up. Uh, but I have to say that, unlike Labour, we will continue to live within our means and we won't go back to square one. Well, Mr Speaker, this process hasn't been very convincing to Mike Bird, the Conservative leader of Walsall Council, who says, never ever believe what you hear from central government. Austerity <laughs> is not over. 
Her MPs seem to have lost a lot of confidence in her and to have her councillors as well. And not far away in Derby, the Conservative Council says financial outlook is extremely challenging with government austerity measures confirmed as continuing. Will the Prime Minister try and clear up these, cheer up these gloomy Tories in Derby and confirm to them that uh, next week the budget will cancel the £1.3 billion cut planned for local government next year? Prime Minister! I say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, actually we're making £1.3 billion more money available in, the, in these next two years to councils. And I'm pleased to say, I'm pleased to say... I'm pleased to say that council tax is down in real terms since under the last Labour government. But if he, if, he, if he wants to sort of make statements about what should be in the budget, perhaps we ought to look at his past predictions. He said that our plans would mean a million people losing their jobs. What have we seen? 3.3 million more in work. He said, he said our plans would mean Greek levels of youth unemployment. And what have we seen? Youth unemployment is at a record low. So, so he'll, he'll find out what's in the budget next week. But there's one thing that we know for certain. Labour will still make a mess of the economy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister didn't get round to mentioning the record numbers of people on zero-hours contracts. <laughs> The record levels The record levels of in work poverty, meaning people in work have to access a food bank and wages lower in real terms than they were eight years ago. And that her government has cut forty nine per cent from local governments since two thousand and ten. Staffordshire police have lost five hundred officers. On Sunday the Chief Constable, Gareth Morgan, said sorry to his police colleagues and their families as they had to cancel rest days just to maintain the service. He apologised to his officers. Will the Prime Minister apologise to the police as well? Yeah. Prime Minister! The, the right honourable gentleman, that he talks about the police and about what is available for the, the uh, police. Of course, what we saw at the last election was the Labour Party saying £300 million more pounds should be made available to the police. What we have done is made available £460 million more pounds to, uh, 460 more pounds to the police. Um, but can I, can I also say to the right honourable gentleman, if he wants to talk about figures, I actually have a book here that's edited by the Shadow Chancellor, and in an article by an, an economic adviser to the Labour Party, he says about their last manifesto, the numbers did not add up. <laughs> This was a welcome, that this was a welcome feature and largely irrelevant. Well, it, may, it may be irrelevant to the Right Honourable Gentleman and the Shadow Chancellor, but it's not irrelevant to the people whose taxes go up, whose jobs are lost and whose children have to pay Labour's debt. Only one party costed their manifesto in the last election and it wasn't the Tory party. For all she says, Mr Speaker, for all she says about police, the reality is there are 21,000 less police officers than there were eight years ago. And she should listen to the Chief Constable of the West Midlands, who says criminals are taking advantage of these cuts. And I quote, we're struggling to deliver a service to the public. I think the criminals are well aware of how stretched we are. Two weeks ago, the Prime Minister told the House that people on universal credit will be protected. The very next day, the Secretary of State for Work and Pensions said some people will be worse off on universal credit. Yep. Which statement is true? Yep. Yep. Prime Minister! Can I remind the Right Honourable Gentleman what I made clear to the House was that those people who are moved uh, through the managed migration process onto universal credit will indeed have the protections of, I think it's a, around £3 billion of transitional protection. But let me just tell him what happens under universal credit. No, no. 200,000. Oh, the shadow. 
the Shadow Foreign Secretary says no, 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 because they don't want to know what happens in terms of universal trade. Two, two hundred thousand more people into work. 700,000 people getting the extra money they're entitled to, and one million disabled households get more money per month. We're not replicating the old system because the old system didn't work. This is a system that helps people into work and makes sure work pays. Mr Speaker, I think the Prime Minister is completely out of touch with the reality of what universal credit is about. Fifty pounds per week worse off. Weeks waiting for the first payment when they move on to universal credit. People going into debt. People losing their homes. People stressed out beyond belief because they can't make ends meet and having to access a food bank just to feed their children. That is the reality of universal credit. Mr Speaker, eight years of Tory austerity means there are 40,000 nurse vacancies in the NHS. The numbers of students applying for nurse training has fallen by over 16,000 since the cut in the nurse bursary. The Prime Minister told us austerity is over. Will the Government take the necessary step next week in the Budget of restoring the nurse bursary so those who want to become nurses in our NHS can realise their ambitions? Prime Minister! The Right Honourable Gentleman mentioned in Universal Credit the weight that people have in order to get their first payment. We announced in the Budget last year that we were reducing the period of time that people had to wait for their first payment. And what did the Right Honourable Gentleman and the Labour Party do? They voted against that change. And then he talks about if there is an end to austerity, actually we should be doing more for the National Health Service. Can I remind the Right Honourable Gentleman? It is this Government that has announced that we are going to be putting £394 million a week more into the National Health Service. At the last election, Labour said that with 2.2% more money into the NHS each year, it would be the envy of the world. Well, I can tell the House we're not putting 2.2% in. We're not putting 2.5% in. We're not putting 3% in. We're putting an extra 3.4% in with a long-term plan that will deliver for people up and down this country. Mr Speaker, applications for nurse training dropped by 12% in September. That's the reality of taking away the nurse bursary. Those that want to become nurses cannot afford to go into debt in order to do a job they want to do, and we all need them to do. Mr Speaker, this Government is simply not being straight with the public. They promised an end to austerity. They can't even fool their own councillors. They promised the NHS an extra £20 billion. We don't know where it's coming from or when yeah. it's coming. GP numbers falling, health visitor numbers falling, and nurse numbers falling also. They promised universal credit would protect everyone. Oh, the Work and Pension Secretary let the cat out of the bag. People will be worse off. The Prime Minister claimed she's ending austerity. So will she confirm that in next week's budget there will be more police on our streets, more nurses in our hospital, and elderly people in desperate need of care will not go ignored and forgotten by her government. The uh, right honourable gentleman. What have we seen under this government? We've seen more money being available to the police. We've seen more money for the health service, more money for social care, more money going into local authorities, more money going into our schools. And at the end of this parliament, at the end of this parliament, we'll be spending five hundred million pounds more in real terms on people of working age and children in our welfare system. But let's actually look at what we now know about what the Labour Party's alternative is. Because we now see, we now see, as reported by a respected academic, that by their own admission, Labour's plans would cost £1,000 billion. Pounds. That's the equivalent, the equivalent of 
£35,000 for every household in this country. We know what that would mean. Higher debt, higher taxes, fewer jobs. Labour just taking us back to square one. Alex Chalk! Betteridge Special Schools do a fantastic job of educating (coughs) SEN children in my constituency. But in the last decade, they've had to contend with an explosion in pupil complexity, emotional, behavioural and medical. Does the Prime Minister agree that we need a careful examination about what lies behind these seismic changes so that in years to come we can deliver the best possible outcomes for all our children? Yeah. Minister. Can I thank my <laughs> honourable friend for raising what is a very, very important issue. And it is absolutely vital that we have for these children the right combination of education, health and care provision that is going to provide them to ensure that they have the support, the education that's right for them and they're able to reach their full potential just as other children. And our reforms both to special educational needs and disability system are key to this. But the point my honourable friend raises about research and the increasing complexity I think is a very important one. And the Department of Education, I'm pleased to say, does have a number of research projects in uh, fields relating to these children and young people and we're committed to, to to building up that rich body of evidence on the identification uh, and on the outcomes and educational experiences. And the Department is also scoping new work that would help again to lead to our understanding of these issues so we can ensure these children get the right support that they need. Yeah. Blackford. Yeah. Yeah, you? Thank you, Mr Speaker. The kidnapping, the killing and the mutilation of the respected Saudi journalist Jibal Khashoggi has rightly shocked the world. A killing that has all the hallmarks of being a premeditated murder. Angela Merkel has announced her government will no longer approve new arms sales exports to the Saudi Kingdom. That is moral leadership. The UK government must take decisive action. Words of condemnation will not do. Will the Prime Minister finally commit to ending the sale of arms to Saudi Arabia. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, uh, it might be helpful for the House if I take this opportunity to update the House on this uh, this particular issue, because as I told the House on Monday, we condemn the killing of the journalist Jamal Khashoggi in the strongest possible terms. And after his disappearance, we made clear that Saudi Arabia must cooperate with Turkey and conduct a full and credible investigation. The claim that has been made that Mr Khashoggi died in a fight does not amount to a credible explanation, so there does remain an urgent need to establish exactly what has happened in relation to this. The Foreign Secretary, other Foreign Ministers and our Ambassador have been making our position very clear to the Saudi Arabians. I myself expect to speak to King Salman later today, and I can update... I can update the House that no minister or official is attending the investment conference in Saudi Arabia, and my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, is taking action against all suspects to prevent them entering the UK. And if these individuals uh, currently have visas, those visas will be revoked today. Ian Blackford. Well, I'm afraid the Prime Minister said nothing about arms sales. Condemnation won't do. It's action which is required. Mr. Speaker. The Saudi Arabia regime is responsible for multiple human rights violations. Critics face death by crucifixion, teenagers tortured, women imprisoned for campaigning for their human rights, the brutal bombardment of Yemen, pushing that country to the brink of famine, and now the state-sponsored murder of Jamal Khashoggi. What more evidence of criminality does the Prime Minister need before she fully commits to ending the sales of arms to the brutal regime in Saudi Arabia. Prime Minister. Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we are concerned about the humanitarian issues in the Yemen, that we are actually the third largest humanitarian donor to the Yemen, and our support has provided significant uh, support to millions of uh, men, women and children in the Yemen. I might remind the right honourable gentleman that, yes, we do support the Saudi-led coalition military intervention in Yemen. That was recognised, has been recognised by the United Nations Security Council, and it came at the request of the legitimate President Hardy. Now, in relation to defence exports, the procedures we follow are among the strictest in the world. They were introduced... 
They were introduced in the year 2000 by the late Robin Cook. They were updated in 2014 by the Conservative-led Coalition Government to reflect our obligations under the Arms Trade Treaty. And a licence will not be issued to Saudi Arabia or any other destination if to do so would be inconsistent with any provision of the consolidated EU and national arms export licensing criteria. And in July 2017, the High Court ruled that our sales to Saudi Arabia were compliant with those regulations. But of course, we keep these under review. A lot of members still waiting to contribute, and we must try to accommodate them. Richard Graham. Mr Speaker, last week the Shadow Chancellor visited Gloucester, saying that my constituency had suffered from austerity. In fact, Labour's high unemployment has been slashed. Investment, manufacturing and apprenticeships are strongly up. A new centre for the homeless established. Two NHS trusts rated good. And a new Gloucester Transport Hub, funded by the Government, opens tomorrow. Does my right honourable friend agree that although we must do more, all of what we have achieved so far would be severely damaged if the opposition leadership had their chance to impose on us again economic bankruptcy and constituents better off on benefits than in work? And he's absolutely right if he looks at the record of this government. First of all, may I say, may I congratulate him on the work that he has done and, and pay tribute to the work that he has done with the charity having, having a voice in Gloucester, with, I believe, uh, Bishop Rachel. I think this, is, this charity is doing important work in Gloucester. But he's absolutely right. We see overall employment at a near record high, youth unemployment, as I said earlier, at a new record low, and real wages rising. That is the benefit of a Conservative government taking a balanced approach to our economy. And the one thing we do know is that the Labour Party would undo all of that good and leave our, our economy in a mess once again. Gordon Marsden. Uh, can I give the Prime Minister some brief relief from Brexit and ask her about dogs? Last week, Behind her. Last week DEFRA's Select Committee, with its specific breeds, said that the Dangerous Dogs Act, with its specific breeds definition, was not fit for purpose, with the hundreds, of, hundreds of pit bull type dogs confiscated yearly and destroyed with no impact on the dog bite numbers. So, will the Prime Minister ask the DEFRA Secretary to act urgently on the Committee's recommendations yeah. Yeah. and not take the approach of the Lords Minister, who told them an even a good tempered dog had to be put down as collateral damage. My wonderful bull terrier type dog was rescued from the streets, and to think of her being destroyed because her face didn't fit in court is chilling. Yeah. Well, we've heard quite a bit about the dog situation, <laughs> but I think we're going to hear more. The Prime Minister. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that I haven't looked at the detail of the uh, re Select Committee report on that particular issue, but I can assure him that the Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs is himself a keen dog owner, as indeed is the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who is sitting next to me as well. And the Secretary of State will be looking at this issue very carefully. Paul <laughs> Masterton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, we might not make much whisky in East Remshire, but we do enjoy drinking it. And Scotch whisky is the jewel in the crown of our food and drink sector. Last year's duty freeze has raised more money for the Exchequer, just as Scottish Conservatives argued it would. And the industry continues to make more positive investment in our communities. So, is it the least we can do on Monday? It would be to extend that freeze for another year. Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, can I, can I thank the, uh, my honourable friend for the lobby that he has put in? I'm sure the Chancellor has heard what he said. Of course, he will. Uh, uh, as ever in relation to the budget, everybody will have to wait until the budget is delivered to find out what is in it. But can I say to the honourable gentleman, because he and uh, my Conservative colleagues from Scotland mounted a, a, a robust campaign on Scotch whisky duty last year, and we were pleased to be able to take the. the uh, stance that we did in relation to the duty, because we recognise the importance of Scotch whisky to the UK. And I have to say, it was a record-breaking uh, year. There was a record-breaking year in 2017, and in the first half of 2018, Scotch whisky exports increased further to nearly two billion pounds. This is an important industry. Patrick Grady. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. How does denying, delaying, or disrupting visas? for Moldovan and African trade commissioners, Palestinian academics, artists at WOMAD and Celtic Connections, or Malawian priests and pupils enhance her vision of a global Britain? Does she understand that the visa crisis and perceived travel ban only serves to prove that the hostile environment lives on and that Brexit is a small, isolationist retreat from the world stage? Yeah. Prime Minister! 
the Honourable Gentleman that the reality is far different from the situation that he has pointed out. There is no travel ban. We remain open to business. We remain open to people from around the, uh, around the world. And we will continue to do so under the new immigration system, a skills-based immigration system that we'll be introducing when we leave the EU. Uh, David T.C. Davis. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister, women who have got concerns about proposals to change the Gender Recognition Act, which would allow self-definition of gender, have had their meeting venues cancelled, been subject to intimidation, and even been dragged into courts as a result of private prosecutions. Would the Prime Minister agree to a short meeting with a victim of sexual violence who believes that these plans will needlessly put more women in danger? Prime Minister. To my honourable friend, that he has raised what is a very important subject. I think it is, it is right that we are making these proposals in relation to gender reform, but of course it is a very sensitive issue, and we do have to make sure that as any changes are made, we are taking into account the potential impact that it could have in relation to uh, women. And I'm very sorry to hear of the experience of the individual that he, that he uh, mentioned in his question. In the run-up to the consultation and during the consultation on the Gender Recognition Act, officials did meet with over 90 different groups, including LGBT groups, women's groups, refugees and domestic abuse charities. But this is an important and sensitive issue and we want voters to be heard. And can I suggest to my honourable friend that I will ask a minister from the Government Equalities Office, who are leading on this particular issue, to meet with him and the individual concerned to hear directly their experience. Jess Phillips. Thank you, Mr Speaker. It seems that our laws allow rich and powerful men to pretty much do whatever they want as long as they can pay to keep it quiet. So does the Prime Minister support the Court of Appeal's decision to back non-disclosure agreements which have been used to silence women who have been sexually harassed and others who have been racially abused? What can I say to the uh, Honourable Member that she will understand that I can't comment on a particular case that is currently before the courts. What I will say, what I have said previously, is that sexual harassment in the workplace is against the law. Such abhorrent behaviour should not be tolerated. And an employer that allows that harassment of women to go undealt with is sending a message about how welcome they are and about their value in the, uh, in the workplace. So just as we won't accept any behaviour that causes people to feel intimidated or humiliated in the workplace, there must be consequences for failing to comply with the law. Non-disclosure agreements cannot stop people from whistleblowing, uh, but it is clear some employers are using them unethically. And the Government is going to bring forward measures for consideration, for consultation, to seek to improve the regulation around non-disclosure agreements and make it absolutely explicit to employees when a non-disclosure agreement does not apply or cannot be enforced. And Justine Greening. Thank you, Mr Speaker. At the moment, if you pay a mortgage, those mortgage payments every month help you build up your credit history. But if you pay a rent every month, it doesn't, which no. just isn't fair. Yeah. But we can fix this for 15 million renters, and the Credit Worthiness Assessment Bill is something that could help give affordable credit for all of us to be able to get on in life, including mortgages, to millions more renters across the country. Yeah, yeah. Will the Prime Minister take the opportunity of the budget uh, next week to look at whether the government can give support for this cross-party supported bill that has already passed through the Lords unamended. Prime Minister. I'd like to thank my right honourable friend for raising this issue. As she will uh, be aware, uh, of course, I can't say what will be in the budget next week, but she will have noticed that the Chancellor of the Exchequer will have heard the uh, point that she has made. Uh, Christine Jardine. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, unlike my honourable friend from East Renfrewshire, my constituency does depend on the Scotch whisky um, industry, which is why it's um, perhaps suffering with so many people like myself supporting Macmillan at the moment with Go Sober. But, um, other, and the threat from Brexit. And of course, stubborn Brexiteer isolationism could see us faced with a hard border on the Republic of Ireland and a disconnect with parts of the country which voted overwhelmingly for Remain. So is the Prime Minister ready to accept that her party's narrow-minded nationalism poses an existential threat to the United Kingdom and that Brexiteer belligerence could break up Britain? People to the Honourable Lady. 
The Prime Minister. Can I say to the Honourable Lady, we are working in the national interest and we are working for a good deal with the European Union that will ensure we can continue to trade across all industries that are important to this country, such as the Scotch Whisky Association, not only with the EU but with other countries around the world, on good terms that will enhance that industry, which, as she says, is important for her constituency. We are working for a good deal for the whole of the United Kingdom once we are outside the European Union. Uh, Dame Caroline Spellman. <laughs> The emission of diesel engines are much cleaner and comparable with petrol. Can the Prime Minister use her good offices to help adjust vehicle excise duty rates, which are having the perverse effect of people hanging on to their older, more polluting diesel cars and causing job losses from falling sales in the car industry? Prime Minister. I thank my right honourable friend for raising this, uh, this issue. Uh, I think that was a budget bid that she was uh, making to me, and as she will know, as I've answered before, obviously uh, the budget will be announced next week. Uh, this is an important issue, though, because we have seen, of course, demand for new diesel cars fall by 17% in 2017. That decline actually is in line with other major European car markets. Um, demand fell, for example, in Germany by 13%. Um, but it is because of the health impacts of nitrogen oxide that, that we see these changing patterns and that it has been important to take, uh, to take action on this. And we want to ensure that manufacturers actually come forward with cleaner cars as soon as possible. Cummins. Thank you, Mr Speaker. <coughs> West Yorkshire Police has 900 fewer officers than it did eight years ago, the result of a 45% rise in violent and sexual crimes in my constituency this year. And now the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners have warned that the government's pension shortfall will cost £165 million and leave 4,000 fewer officers on our streets. In West Yorkshire alone, this means another 400 officers lost. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that this is a national scandal and that the police should be fighting for fighting crime and not fighting for funding. Prime Minister! I say to the Honourable Lady that, of course, we have seen an increase in, particularly she referenced, the, I think, the issue around sexual abuse crimes and, and crimes of that sort. We have seen an increase in the uh, number of crimes being reported. But that is partly because we've now got an atmosphere where people are more willing and ready to come forward uh, and report these crimes. She refers to the issue of the pensions. This is an issue that has been uh, known for some years. Mr Jacob Rees-Mogg. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Mr Speaker. There have been reports today that the Government is willing to agree that the European Court of Justice would be the final arbiter in most cases arising from Brexit. As this would be inconsistent with the Prime Minister's previous commitments, will she authoritatively deny it? Prime Minister. I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I haven't seen those particular reports. I see quite a few reports about uh, claims about what is happening in relation to Brexit. I haven't seen those particular reports, but if they are as he has suggested, then they are wrong. We have been very clear in the work that we have been doing about ensuring that in the future uh, the, juris the European Court of Justice does not have jurisdiction in the UK. Tonya Antoniazzi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This week's hard-hitting Women and Equalities Committee report on sexual harassment in public places, the use of NDAs by perpetrators of sexual harassment, the pernicious two-child policy, and women bearing the brunt of budget cuts to services. Equality is stalling under this government. And how is the Prime Minister going to address this? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Lady, the position is not as she has set out in her question. We do see, in fact, women with greater opportunities today. We see more women in the workplace, uh, and we see, crucially, uh, through the work that we've been doing, for example, on the gender pay gap and the uh, requirement on companies to report on, on uh, gender pay, uh, that we are seeing action being taken in relation to that, and that pay gap has, over the years, been coming down. But can I also say to her that I absolutely take seriously this issue of sexual harassment and bullying in the workplace. I think it is very important that anybody in any workplace is able to be treated and feel that they are being treated with respect and dignity, and that action is taken to ensure that we eradicate sexual harassment and bullying in the workplace. Sir Henry Bellingham. Speaker, does Sir Prime Minister agree with me that when veterans have already been investigated by both military and civilian authorities. They should never be handed a pursuit unless there is overwhelming new evidence. I would like to thank the Prime Minister for her personal engagement on this issue. But does she agree with me that what is happening to numerous Northern Ireland veterans at the moment 
It's against natural justice, it's damaging to recruitment, and it's contrary to the military covenant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Minister! Can I say to my honourable friend, first of all, that we do owe a vast debt of gratitude to the heroism and bravery of the soldiers and police officers yeah. who upheld the rule of law and were themselves accountable to it, uh, something which will always set them apart from, and, apart from and above the terrorists who, during the Troubles in Northern Ireland, were responsible for the deaths of hundreds of members of the security forces. Now, the current system in Northern Ireland is flawed. It isn't working. It isn't working for soldiers. It isn't working for police officers. It isn't working for victims. And that victims group, of course, includes many soldiers and police officers as well. So, while a number of terrorist murders from the Troubles are actively under investigation by PSNI and other police forces, I'm clear that under current mechanisms for investigating the past, there is a disproportionate fo focus on former members of the armed forces and the police. And we're committed to ensuring that all outstanding deaths in Northern Ireland should be investigated in a way that is fair, balanced and proportionate. Yeah. Yeah. Nell and Joan. Thank you very much, Mr yeah. Speaker. Now, I know the, the Prime Minister's already said she doesn't know what's in next week's budget. Now, she probably doesn't know if she's going to be Prime Minister next week. Perhaps that's not a surprise. <laughs> Tax reliefs for private schools is not a good use of public money. And will she just have a little word with the Chancellor sitting next to her? Prime Minister! Can I say to the Honourable Lady what I said was about the budget was I wasn't going to tell the House today. You have to wait till Monday. Yeah. Nicky Morgan! Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. My right hand friend will remember visiting the Defence National Rehabilitation Centre at Stanford Hall, uh, which sits between uh, the Rushcliffe constituency of my right hand learned friend and uh, the constituency of uh, Loughborough. Um, she knows that the N uh, relies on the NHS being able to work with and benefit from the rehabilitation of those brave, arm brave armed forces she has just spoken about. What it really needs now is for my right honourable friends to bring together yep. people both in national government but also local NHS commissioners to get the final decisions to, made to make sure that we have this world-class yep. facility to benefit people in need of rehabilitation. Um, I myself am not going to be uh, going there, but I can see that actually uh, repairs to injured legs are something that are very yeah. important. Yeah. Yeah. Can I, can I say Minister. to my right honourable friend that, first of all, I'm sure the whole House will want to join me in paying tribute to the courage and dedication of our armed forces, and for the vast majority, their experience of serving is positive. Uh, of course, we do see those members of our armed forces who sadly do suffer injuries which are life changing, and uh, the ability, the uh, uh, rehabilitation capacity and capability that has been built up at Headley Court and that is now uh, being uh, put forward in the new Defence National Rehabilitation Centre is very important. It was in Incredible to actually meet people who had been through that rehabilitation and see the massive change it had made to their lives. This could be a huge uh, benefit to the National Health Service as well. And I thank my right honourable friend for highlighting this issue. The question of National Health Service patients being able to use this centre is one that is an important aspect. It's in everybody's uh, uh, aim is to be able to ensure that that can happen. And I understand my right honourable friend, the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care, is currently reviewing the proposal for NHS patients to benefit from this legacy of expertise in the new centre. Sir Vincent Cable. Does the uh, Prime Minister not accept that the very sensible objectives of universal credit? to simplify benefits and improve work incentives were seriously undermined by the 2015 budget of her friend, the former Chancellor, who slashed the work allowance. And that, together with administrative rigidity, are now causing enormous hardship in families and single parents. So would she listen to the charities and her own backbenchers who are urging her to pause the rollout until these deficiencies are remedied? Prime Minister, the right honourable gentleman, he, he rightly makes the point that what the universal credit system does is introduce a system which is simpler, a single benefit, a single claim, rather than something like six claims that people might have been making. It is also a benefit which encourages and works with people to help them into the workplace, and it is also a benefit that ensures that as they earn more, they keep more. This is a benefit that is good for people, as we see from the extra numbers in work uh, on receipt of uh, universal credit, and uh, as we see from the fact uh, that the, for people who go on to universal credit, the evidence is that they are then able go on, they then go on to earn more in the workplace. 
encouraging people into work, making sure work pays, a simpler system. Those are the benefits of universal credit. Uh, Dr Caroline Johnson. Children's doctor, I have seen how some young people with life threatening conditions and their families can struggle to receive the care and support they need, particularly respite care and out of hours community care. I would therefore like to draw my right honourable friend's attention to the report by the APPG for Children Who Need Palliative Care, which I co chair with the honourable member for Newcastle North. Can I ask my right honourable friend to take a personal interest in this report so we can work together to ensure that our most vulnerable children and families get the support that they need and deserve? Can I, can I say to my honourable friend that this it is an important issue, and obviously, with her particular experience, she is uh, well aware of it in a, in a sense that many of us uh, will not be. But I'd like to thank her, first of all, for the work that she undertakes as the co-chair of the APPG for children who need palliative care. And, of course, I'm sure the thoughts of our, the whole House are with those parents who find themselves uh, in this situation. We have made a commitment to everyone at the end of life, including children, uh, setting out the actions we're taking to make high quality and personalisation a reality for all, and to end the variation in end of, of life care. This covers a whole range of aspects, including practical and emotional support, uh, because that's an important aspect of good end of life care. And that's set out, of course, in our uh, end of life commitment and our ambitions for palliative care framework. But it can be difficult for some commissioners to develop suitable care models for children. And that's why I understand NHS England is convening an expert group to develop commissioning models which are suitable for this particularly vulnerable group of patients and ensure they get the support and care they need. Faisal Rashid. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Prime Minister assure the hundreds of my constituents for in Warrington South who have been trapped in their homes by spiralling ground rents that the government's commitment to crack down on unfair leasehold practices will be fulfilled and the government will restrict some ground rents to zero as promised by the former housing minister less than a year ago. Minister. Can I say to the honourable gentleman we are indeed following up on our commitments in that area. Yeah, yes. Mrs Theresa Villiers. The whole House should welcome the commitment to another 20 20 billion from, for the NHS. Will the Prime Minister agree it's vital that the NHS produces a plan to use this money wisely to strengthen frontline care, including expanding GP services for my constituents yeah, in Chile yeah. Barnet? Minister! Can I say to my right honourable friend, she's absolutely right. This is the biggest cash boost that the, the NHS will have received in its history. It is important that this is actually it is important that this is used carefully and properly to ensure that uh, care for patients is being improved. That is one of the principles that we've set out for the 10-year plan that the NHS is working on at the moment, and I'm sure the NHS will be looking carefully at the GP services in her own constituency. Jarvis. Yeah. I'm sure the whole House will want to send their best wishes to the Honourable Member for Coventry North West, who's recovering from a recent operation. In his absence, and with, with his blessing, we will proceed with the third reading of his organ donation bill this coming yeah. Friday. Yeah. Is it, a bill, it is a bill that will save lives and give hope to many. The Prime Minister previously has been very supportive, as has the Leader of the Opposition. So can I ask her today, please, to reconfirm her support for this important bill on Friday? Prime Minister, first of all, join the honourable gentleman and other members of this house in wishing the uh, honourable member for Coventry North West the very best, uh, and to say that we do indeed continue to support this bill. As the honourable gentleman has said, it's very important and it will save lives. Sir Bernard Jenkin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I join my right honourable friend's uh, praise and best wishes? to the retiring Cabinet Secretary, Sir Jeremy yeah, Hayward. Yeah, yeah. uh, he not only served many governments, he also appeared in front of many select committees like my own and was as popular amongst members of Parliament as amongst his colleagues. He will be missed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we're extremely <laughs> grateful. The Prime Minister. Can I, can I, can I thank uh, my honourable friend for the comments that he has made? He is absolutely right. Sir Jeremy, as I said, has been for three, more than three decades an exemplary civil servant. His public service is second to none, uh, and I'm sure he enjoyed the opportunity to appear before my honourable friend's committee. Oh, I imagine it was probably the height of his enjoyment. Who could possibly have thought otherwise? And we're grateful to the Prime Minister for what she said. Fiona Onasanya. 
Thank you, Mr Speaker. Given the £1.2 million worth of cuts per year since 2014 to children's services in my constituency, does the Prime Minister believe we have adequate resources for SEND in Peterborough? Yes. Prime Minister. I to the Honourable Lady that we do take the issue of children's services very carefully because all children, no matter where they live, should have access to high quality care. Uh, spending on the most vulnerable children has increased by over £1 billion since 2010. But of course, it's not simply about money, it's about count- how councils deliver good and excellent services. And we need to ensure that everybody is delivering according to best practice. And that's why we're improving social work training, we're spreading innovation and uh, best practice and where councils aren't delivering the standards of service we expect will intervene to make sure they improve. Thank you. Order. We'll come to the Honourable Gentleman Ere Long.